Hey, everybody. Um, this is my second year speaking at Startup Fest, and I have now created a pattern of only building my slides the night before. Um, I was doing the uh, 100K Prize yesterday, met many of you probably there, and then the Angel Summit the day before. So the, the slides in quality of presentation are going to be the worst slides you've ever seen. I hope that the quality of the content and advice are some of the best that you've received. Uh, so a little bit about me, um, as Sarah mentioned, I uh, am an entrepreneur running my own company called Better Company. Uh, uh, I'm originally from Canada, but I now live in San Francisco. And I'm, I think now, the most active angel investor in Canadian startups. There's a bunch of those startups that I've invested here, um, some of whom you may know. Um, and I started Better Company wanting to ensure that people could talk honestly about what was happening in their career and get the best perspective and advice. And so that's what we started with. Um, but it turned out that in order to actually make money, what we are now in the business of doing is selling software that helps big companies, large companies, recruit their, their team. I won't tell you about the solution that we provide because I don't want to market to you, but how many people in this room are, are planning on hiring more than 10 people this year? Okay, good. Um, so, you know, I'm a serial entrepreneur, I'm 38 years old, and yet before I started selling software into talent acquisition, as an entrepreneur, I realized I knew nothing about how to hire well. So I wanted to kind of share some of my thoughts and experiences on really, you know, we talk about culture all the time. We know that the people that we attract into our organization are responsible for growing our business, and yet most of us are terrible at hiring. Um, hiring in general is hard and time consuming for founders, but when you talk about hiring the people that can actually have a game changing impact on the scale of your business, that is almost impossible. And so the talk is really focused on how to hire the types of people that I hope every person here who's a founder and entrepreneur is dreaming about being able to recruit to the organization. So the purpose of this talk is really to help you step by step understand how to be able to actually recruit people that today you might think would be impossible to attract to your organizations. Um, so I think the thing that, that is required most in hiring exceptional talent is a shift in mindset. And I call this the founder's paradox because we're all, I hope, thinking that our business is the best business, right? That anybody could want to invest in, buy from us, right, work for us. This is our attitude. And yet, ultimately, you know, there is an insecurity about, well, I don't have a lot of money, and I don't have a lot of traction, and so, you know, I'll put off trying to attract the people that could be those 10x scalers for me for when I have that momentum. But, you know, ultimately, the thing of it is is that we have to be building a relationship with the type of talent that we want to hire two, three years before we're ready to be able to hire them. So um, every single real relationship in your life takes time to build. The amount of trust that somebody needs to have to join your company and take, you know, the, the chance that you know, they're gambling their time, money, and professional reputation on your company, the amount of confidence and the amount of, of trust that they have to have in you as the entrepreneur has got to be real. And that's not going to happen in 30 days. It's not going to happen in 60 days. It's not going to happen in 90 days. And by the way, you know, we, I hope that you know, most founders are trying to build relationships with investors long before they need to raise. Often you know that in order to acquire a customer, especially if you're selling in the enterprise or trying to develop a channel partnership, those things don't happen overnight either. They, they take six, nine, 12 months to build. The same should be understood and expected of our talent. One of my favorite movies, Spy Game, starts with Robert Redford's character who's retiring from the CIA that day um, and his assistant, uh, says to him, are you a little paranoid? Uh, you seem to be, you know, he's trying to, to, to 
uh, throw away a bunch of documents relating to this, uh, this mission. And he goes to Gladys, his assistant, when did Noah build the ark, Gladys? Before the rain, before the rain. I built that, by the way, last night. I didn't, wasn't aware of the rain, but, but, but seriously, you know, every good thing takes time to build before you can, you, can, you can unlock that value. And the same is true of the people that you want to hire. So a friend of mine um, has a, 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 a ratio in finding and buying real estate. He says, look at 100, offer on 10 to find the one that's perfect for you. This same ratio that's worked well for him in real estate is the exact same ratio for hiring the perfect people that have both the skills and the cultural fit with you and your team. So 100 people that you need to talk to for every single major role in your organization to find 10 that are even potentially aligned and, and willing to go, and then the one that you'll end up hiring. So how do we hire top talent? The first thing is we have to start long before we need it. And so what I ask you to do is actually start by envisioning your, your org chart two years from now. Imagine every one of your goals, everything that you expect and want to have happen. If those things happen, who will you need to hire and who will you be able to hire to expand the, the success of your business? And identify 20 to 30 people per position that you're identifying in that future roadmap that look like potential fits as executives for your organization. And ultimately, you should be identifying that list from companies that have already raised a Series A. And I would argue the more capital and the more growth that they've had, the more likely they are to have the experience that when you catch up a year, two, three years from now, they'll have had the experience that will immediately be able to scale your business. Um, and you know, the average tenure inside of most organizations across the board is two and a half years. So if you're looking to hire somebody two, three years from now, start by identifying somebody that's just about a year in to that organization. Um, so every single one of the people that you want to hire Every other organization is thinking the same. And many of these people, you don't have, in many cases, recruiters who are doing this for you. You're doing it. But there are a ton of people who are paid to do nothing but reach out to these people. And as a, as a function of that, I'm sure many of you in this room have been on the receiving end of in-mails and emails from recruiters. So you have to stand out. And if you start by pitching, I don't care if you're the best pitch in the world, you're going to be ignored. Start by flattery and ask for advice. And mention something of relevance or of interest as to why this person should care about what you're doing. If it's in an adjacent business, they run a marketplace, you run a marketplace for you know, uh, magicians and they run a marketplace for you know, pet groomers, then you, know, you can say, I really love how you guys have managed to scale, I'd love to be able to get some advice, et cetera. And try and offer something that makes you stand out. You know, we've already managed to grow from you know, 10K into bookings to 100K all organically, I'd love to just you know, buy you a coffee. But the humility of the, the, the sincerity of the humility of the, of the offer must be real and sincere. You have to come and say, can I, on your time and on your schedule, find a time that I can buy you a coffee, a lunch, whatever the case may be. And you know, I don't advocate stalking in our personal lives, but there is a degree of pr professional stalking that is, in fact, key to being able to identify and being able to engage with the types of people that you want to hire. Um, and I want to tell you about how professional stalking helped build my network in Silicon Valley. So four years ago, five years ago now, um, I was, you know, in, in, from Silicon Valley's perspective, nobody. Uh, I had worked at Apple 20 years ago, but you know that's 20 years ago. There's nothing relevant. I didn't. I'm a high school dropout. I was living on Vancouver Island. There was nothing notable about me and my little startup that was really nothing more than an idea at this time. But I started following this program, 
and I had identified a guy by the name of, well, I won't say the name. Um, I identified somebody that looked like a perfect type of person that could be a potential customer, a potential investor, but also I would be, you know, he was the VP of product at a company that I want to, I want to disrupt. And um, I'd been following him on Twitter for six months and, you know, trying to engage in conversation passively, replying to things that he's saying, trying to establish mutual interests, and essentially getting nowhere. Um, and a huge lesson here is, is that doing this well will make you feel like you're getting nowhere long before it makes you feel like you're getting somewhere. So um, nevertheless, it was a Sunday night, and uh, early in Obama's uh, first term, he had started tweeting about how Obama was responsible for uh, the GM uh, uh, bankruptcy restructuring negatively. And I'm a big Obama fan, and so I start you know, tweeting at him, and we start doing you know, the political debate back and forth. And um, finally, I said to him, hey, you know, this is you know, too complex for Twitter. Can I buy you a beer, and we can settle this you know, in person? And he looked at my LinkedIn profile, and he said, said that I was in Vancouver Island. And so he said, well, it seems like you're you know, up in Canada. Next time you're in San Francisco, uh, you know, let's do it. I said, well, I'm in San Francisco right now. Uh, and as I was doing that, I was on the, the website for Air Canada. But um, sure enough, Tuesday, I got a meeting with this guy. And we got into his office, and he's like, how do I know you again? I forget. And I'm like, oh, Twitter, we have this thing. And he goes, oh, right, right, right. So in the 45 minutes that we have to talk, 30 minutes of which are spent entirely rehashing this debate, and I'm going, if I don't get the opportunity to actually engage in you know, pitching him or in building an understanding of what we're doing, I'm missing the opportunity. I'm not here to talk politics and to build the relationship. Sure enough, he says, what are you doing? And I show him an early prototype. And he goes, wow, if I'd had this at my company, uh, it would have completely made my life as a manager better. Um, so he says, Let, could I invest 20K? And I said, I'm like, I'm just like, <laughs> like, you know, screaming inside. And he goes, what are the terms? I make them up on the spot. He said, oh, uh, do you mind if I bring so-and-so, which is, you know, one of the top investors in the Valley, to invest as well? Uh, well, let me get back to you. I'm not sure if I'm ready for that. <laughs> Meanwhile, screaming even louder. And, um, and he's become one of the most uh, valuable advisors and, uh, and, a, and a connector to me across the board. But I, I, I want to say that what I'm, you know, what, what I'm talking about here is a process that is repeatable by anybody in this room that, if followed, will open up access to people you never thought were possible for you to reach. But it requires hard, persistent, sluggish work that you have to do over and over and over again until you find success. So it's kind of like religion or many other things. You know, you may not even see it in your lifetime, but hopefully you, see you at the very last minute, you know it was the right thing to do. Um, so most founders, I meet 2,000 founders, not even including conferences like this, 2,000 founders a year. And many of them I say, you know what? What you're doing is really interesting. It's a little too early for me, and I also just met you, so I don't really know who you are. I'm not going to necessarily bet on you without traction, without knowing you better. And one of these cases is a company called Solink. I met, I did an office hours in Ottawa two years ago. It was December 2015. I met them in the office hours. I was incredibly impressed by the co-founder and his story, but it was way too early. And I said what I say to many founders, you know, keep me updated. Let me know how things are going. Most founders don't do that. And so he, like clockwork, every single month for a year, sent updates, not just to me, but to every investor. And they read like a novel. They had amazing data, but they also had, you know, kind of a story that kept you on the edge of the seat until the next update. And uh, a year later, uh, November 2016, I call the CEO up on the weekend and I ask him three questions and I commit to invest and help him raise his Series A, which he's just closing right now. And so that's the persistence that is required for success. Most founders fail because they are not consistently persistent enough. That advice is true across customers, across you know recruiting, across investor relations. And 
you know, ultimately, it's about, you know, trying as best you can to personalize every single interaction. Another thing I've learned is almost all of my success in life is attributable directly to the fact that people liked me enough and had enough of a rapport to want to see me succeed a little bit more than somebody else. And that's because, not that I'm some special guy, but because I demonstrated empathy and, and, and mutual interest. I wasn't just simply looking, I'm never looking to get something out of somebody. I'm always looking for it to be a mutual exchange. And so when you're doing these updates, to be able to be you know, asking about them and seeing through social media, oh, congratulations on the beautiful garden that you just built, or the new baby, or the new this, whatever. These simple touches endear you over time in such a way, in very powerful ways. So, you know, we live in a hyper-networked world, and there is nothing more terrible than to feel like you have wasted your time. There's nothing more frustrating than wasting your time because that's time that you're never gonna get back. And so if you engage with anyone of any kind, it's incumbent upon you to thank them sincerely for their time. This tiny little thing as you start to try and hire more actually is the first thing to fail. Most of our big companies that are, that are our partners, they actually don't even get back to people at all sometimes. If not, if they get back to them, it's too long. They've left them hanging for three weeks while they're waiting for a decision. So related to that is, is that if you are in the process of trying to hire somebody that's applying, it's so important that you communicate the expectations of when they will hear back from you. And if you don't know when, what it is that you need to happen in order for you to be able to give them a commitment or a decision. And again, it's simple stuff, but it is the types of stuff that I see consistently and constantly often getting neglected. And, and ultimately, hiring well is actually, you're not in the hiring business, you're in the rejection business. You're gonna hear no, or you're gonna hear nothing more than you hear yes. And by definition, for every single person that you talk to for a role, you're only gonna hire one person. So understanding what it means to, rejection sucks. And so offering a personalized note, spending that extra 45 seconds instead of sending a templated email saying, I really liked this about you and we thought you know you were a great fit, but ultimately we chose somebody. Just adding that one line is all the difference of that person thinking, wow, you know what, I'm sorry that it didn't work out, but man, they really respected my time to thinking, screw those guys. I spent three hours with them and I get a thanks, but no thanks. I'm gonna tell every single person in my network, don't bother with those people. My three coworkers who are also looking to flee the terrible company that I'm at, and we're talking about the companies that we're interviewing with secretly, we're gonna share those notes. And in fact, one of the greatest sources of talent ever are companies that you know, are having a mass exit of, of, of talent. They're all talking with each other. And this is an opportunity for you to either do it well or do it poorly. And so as I say, treating everyone with respect is a key to building a great talent brand. So this is the thing that you have as a superpower as an entrepreneur in Canada. There are more people in the Valley, in Boston, and in, in New York for a variety of different reasons that are not just political are looking for to come home. They still don't believe, most people do not believe in Canada that there are companies that are actually ambitious enough or, um, or, or have the success potential in their DNA to be able to come home and work for them. I talk to Canadian people, Canadian expats in the Valley about this all the time. They're like, I would come home to Toronto. I would come home to Saskatoon. I would come home to Vancouver. But are there really companies that, you know, have that amazing growth potential like the startups here? The answer is yes. And I hope that many of you in this room feel like you as an entrepreneur are offering them that potential. So in terms of the special filter for the list, I would be looking at every single Waterloo grad 
right? That is currently, you can search on LinkedIn for just who gratted, you know, Waterloo. You can look at what high schools they went to so that you understand, you know, where their home cities are from and develop a potential massive unique opportunity for them to think of coming home. Because what happens is we're incredibly patriotic as Canadians. If we're living in San Francisco, especially as I do, we're getting fed up by the incredible cost of living and the low quality of living. And as we think about having kids, as we start to do often in our early 30s, we're thinking, I want to be near my mom. I want to be near my dad. I want to be my, near my center of support. The expats, we immigrants, do not have families of support, which are so crucial when we're thinking about what's good for our families. So this is a massive superpower that you have, that you have to exploit. And many of the companies that are in my portfolio are, in fact, exploiting this successfully. Drop Loyalty, who just closed their Series A, has had more success in being able to recruit Chef Hero as well. They're bringing people from brand name companies that are doing incredibly well home to Canada. This is your potential. The other thing is, is that when making an appeal to a Canadian in particular, it's incredibly important that you talk about ways in which their talent will not only benefit your company, but benefit the community that they're in. So for example, Seven Shifts, which I just funded in Saskatoon. Seven Shifts fan, <laughs> nice. Um, do you work for Seven Shifts, by the way? I'm from Saskatoon. Amazing. So you know that one of the things that they're doing is they're actually hosting you know, kind of open events where investors and other people in their network are coming to Saskatoon and then sharing in similar types of sessions like this with the broad community, open invite. And what they're finding is at the last event, there were 70 people in Saskatoon. And these people are kind of, you know, they're working on their own bootstrap startup, but they don't have a community. And so your startup in, in places outside of major markets like Toronto and Montreal can in fact be the builder of your own ecosystem, and if not, certainly a contributor. And by the way, this is incredibly relevant. If you're trying to bring people back up, bring them back up in the best weather of your area. I live on Vancouver Island, right? And, and literally, this is the best time of year to bring somebody up and be like, isn't this glorious? Isn't this amazing? Never mind the nine months of the year that is, this day isn't. But, but seriously, like also choosing the moments in which to do this are key. Um, you know, I talked about this before, you know, be clear in your expectations when you're in process with somebody about whether you will hire them and what you need to make that decision and so on. But also be incredibly clear about what you're hiring people for. One of the things that most startups do is they're ambiguous and amorphous in their descriptions or definition of what these people are supposed to do for you. Come on and be awesome. Join the team and crush it. And so it's very, very important, especially with executive level talent, that you're saying, this is the success that we have today. This is the success that I want to see in a year or two from now. Tell me how you would, you know, would achieve greater scale than what we've already achieved. And what do you need from me and the rest of the team by which to be empowered in doing so? That is incredibly important because one thing that happens with you know, with hires is, is that the founder thinks that they want to let go and they think that they want to, is it something I said? Um, um, insecure founder, right? Um, so they, the founder thinks that they want to let go, they think that they want to empower, and then it turns out they actually aren't letting go of that thing. And that person's going to get incredibly frustrated and just leave or just check out. Um, and so it is truly, I, I'd say the sign of an incredible company is that you are in awe of especially your executive leadership team, if not every employee. And by being in awe, I mean that they are teaching you things. Having somebody that is a 10x scaler in your business, it means that every week you're learning something that is making you better as a founder from your team. If that is not happening, you don't have a team that is as strong as you need to be successful. Um, and the final piece of this is, is that, you know, it means that, you know, you really need to be coaching versus managing. 
if you're managing people that should know more about what their business is, then, then you know, if you know more than you, they do, then you've hired the wrong people. And what that means is you need to have them tell you what you need and you need to be the resource provider and to get out of their way to be successful. Um, the thing that nobody talks about in hiring is the fact that when you hire people that are better than the people, you start off with people that are who you can hire. This happens every single time. There's a great blog on this from Fred Wilson, and it talks about how every single startup, as it moves from its infancy to great success, re-racks its leadership team three times. And oftentimes, you end up actually re-racking a lot of your entire talent pool three times as you move from infancy to maturity. Now, the problem is, is that while that's kind of everybody's intellectual expectation, the people that have been there have a very, you know, from the start, have an expectation that they're to be the leaders. And in fact, your CTO and anybody in the early stages of having any kind of title, this is why title inflation for founders, nobody should have a title other than co-founder and this is what I'm responsible for doing. That's it, no titles, no titles. Titles get in the way because, well, wait a second, I'm the VP of engineering, why are you hiring, who's this director of engineering, what are they gonna do? In many cases, the people that you've hired are not people that have ever managed people, and so therefore are not the professional managers of the organization at even 15 or 20 people. So, you know, being able to actually define from the beginning to say, you know what, if, if you achieve everything that you're gonna achieve here, most likely you're then, we're gonna be able to attract in a coach for you that, it's going, that you're going to learn from, who's gonna make the organization 10 times better and you 20 times better. The people that are in a startup should go, that sounds great. You mean that in addition to having all the equity upside and you know, the opportunity to be an early member of this team, I have the ability to 20x up my ability so that I'm infinitely more hireable the next time and I can start my own company and so on. That, is, that should be a good thing, not something to be feared for for eventually being quote unquote replaced. Um, and so defining that as early success I think is incredibly important. Um, one of my favorite quotes of all time that defines I think entrepreneurship is that success requires a persistent misreading of the odds. If as a founder you actually knew the likelihood of success and you contemplated the amount of time, energy, missed opportunity, broken relationships, all these other things, and you realized it was all for naught, only the most insane people would even try it. And I think that's actually why, that's probably the definition of most founders. But I'd say that this also applies to selling too, but it's especially true to recruiting. Not only are you gonna hear no more than you will hear yes, you'll also just not hear anything. On an average day of the kind of reach out that you need to be making, which I would argue would be at least an hour a day every day, and tracking and following these people and getting to know them and so on and so on, at least an hour a day, most of it will have no immediate payoff or even recognition that you're on the right path, but keep going. Um, and you know, in my business, where I, we're selling to you know, very large companies, it takes sometimes as many as 20 touch points over the course of nine, 10 months before we get that first real meeting that can lead to a potential deal. 20 touch points where you're hearing almost nothing. You have to be persistent. And if you're not persistent, you will not succeed. The, uh, and so one of the things about that is don't stop reaching out, but also be letting them know every single outreach is an opportunity to update them. Hey, you know, great to, you know, we talked two months ago, I just wanna let you know that the following three things have happened, would love to get your advice on this, et cetera, et cetera. Being, you know, so that maybe I don't read the first six updates, but then when I read the seventh and I go back and I search my inbox, and I read and I see that every month you said you were gonna do this and you did it, suddenly that relationship of trust begins to build in such a way that I go, 
wow, like this person is really like doing everything that they say. And honestly, the reality of it is, is that most people don't. And so if you're able to show a track record of, of confidence, these people are going to be at least more notionally inclined to engage with you than before. Uh, look, I didn't even finish that slide. If you're hiring more than 10 people, uh, I, I'm happy to talk to you. My, what I was just sharing is my, um, I'm Tom Williams on Twitter, and I'm Tom at bettercompany.co uh, is my email address. Okay, Thank, uh, last question or no? Yeah. Good, thank you everybody. <laughs>